So the, this next session of the morning presentation is going to shift to a panel discussion. And it's really my great um, um, honor to be, to be chairing this this morning. So thank you to the organizing committee and thank you very much to my panel members for agreeing to participate. Um, one of the important measures of healthcare delivery uh, in our society is equity with an expectation of equal access to care. And as we reviewed yesterday in numerous uh, presentations, there are many areas of inequity in the delivery of health care to women with bleeding disorders. And today we've gathered our panel to explore areas where we can improve health care delivery to women with bleeding disorders with a focus on the care of patients with bleeding disorders in more geographically remote communities. Um, today, what we'll do is I'm going to just briefly um, uh, identify each of the speakers who are members of our panel. And once I've done that, then I will um, introduce them uh, one by one in order to have them present briefly uh, um, how it is that they have experience and passion in, in helping us um, improve care in these areas. And then we have a few questions that we have for them, but also I'll be keeping an eye on the uh, chat line. So please, please uh, send any questions that you have. We have, uh, we're really privileged to have such an outstanding panel with us today. So I, again, I'm just gonna go through the uh, names and the bios of the, of the panel members. First off is uh, Dr. Sumita Arya, who is a fifth year hematology fellow at the University of Tom uh, Toronto, completing a master's degree in Clinepi at the uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And her interests include hemostasis, transfusion medicine, women's health, and the provision of person-centered equitable care. Um, her research to date has described barriers amongst patients with inherited bleeding disorders in the Canadian setting. Uh, our next speaker, Dr. Roshni Kulkarni, is currently Professor Emeretta, Peds and Human Development, Michigan State University, and the former director of the Center for Bleeding, Clotting Disorders, and Peds Hemoc. She's the former director Division of Blood Disorders for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. She's a founding member of the Foundation of Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, member of the WFH Women with Inherited Bleeding Disorder Committee, CDC and National Hemophilia Foundation Committees. She's explored telemedicine and the delivery of care for patients with bleeding disorders and is the recipient of numerous illustrious professional awards, including Hemophilia Foundation of Michigan Michigan 2019 Fairy Godmother to Women with Hemophilia, a National Hemophilia Foundation Physician of the Year, FDA and CDC Distinguished uh, Services Awards. Uh, Wendy Quinn is, a, is first and foremost a mother of a son with severe hemophilia A and current president of the Canadian Hemophilia Society, as well as Hemophilia Saskatchewan president. She's been instrumental in the development of the Canadian Comprehensive Standards of Care, the second edition, past member of the National Aging and Bleeding Disorder Committee and Bangladesh Twinning Project. She provides primary care to remote First Nations community with a focus on prenatal and women's health. And our fourth panel member is uh, known to many um, attending this conference, Pam Wilton. She's a respiratory nurse educator. She's also a symptomatic hemophilia carrier with a strong interest in patient advocacy and research. She's a longtime volunteer with the Canadian Hemophilia Society and the World Federation of uh, Hemophilia. So as you can see, we have an excellent uh, panel today and a great opportunity for us to, 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 to think about things differently as we move ahead with, um, with our care in the future. So we're going to begin with a brief review by each of the panel members on their work in this area, uh, beginning with Dr. Aria. 
Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me here today. So we were asked to introduce ourselves and our connection to the area really briefly. So again, um, my name is Sameda Arya and I'm a fifth year hematology fellow at the University of Toronto. And I've been really honored and, and privileged to be able to work with Pam, who's here today, as well as Dr. Michelle Schulzberg and an excellent team through the um, CHS to investigate barriers to care for women and to really all patients with inherited bleeding disorders in the Canadian setting. I did prepare just a few slides just to be able to show maybe some visuals and patient quotes because I really wanted patients to be able to reflect and to tell their stories because I recognize that a lot of this work out of necessity needs to be patient driven as opposed to clinician centric and clinician driven. And so this has been a research interest of mine for the last five years. And these are some of the um, some of the things that we've been really fortunate to present. Great, so I'll just go on to this next slide here. And I thought maybe photos might tell a better story than words. And so on the left hand side, these are some of the main themes that we saw when we interviewed women across Canada recruited through the Canadian Hemophilia Society with respect to uh, lived experiences and really their own experiences, um, having a variety of inherited bleeding disorders ranging from rare disorders, but also on Willebrand's disease and um, being symptomatic hemophilia carriers. So the four main themes that we found were uncertainties surrounding their diagnosis. So for example, difficulties even differentiating normal and abnormal bleeding symptoms, challenges with diagnostic labels, which I think is really a whole quagmire in of itself, and misdiagnoses and diagnostic delay. Many women discussed conceptualizing their experiences through family bleeding and in fact having symptomatic but undiagnosed female family members, whereas often the affected male relative would be the key to their own diagnosis. And many also described intensity of bleeding symptoms ranging from heavy menstrual bleeding to postpartum hemorrhage and procedural bleeding, which resultingly had a significant impact on their identity and daily life, including a sense of stigma or discrimination, impact on education, work and hobbies, and finding empowerment through speaking with others with similar lived experiences. And I've highlighted just a few of the main barriers that we found here, and I'm sure we'll discuss this more during the panel, so I won't belabor them too much, but some of the main things that came up were lack of awareness, symptom dismissal, as well as limited access to care and treatment plans, which is particularly relevant, especially as this is more focused on um, patients in remote areas, and so very relevant to our discussion today. And I'll just briefly highlight some of the work we've done with men so far as well, where we interviewed 11 men. And you can see that there are some areas of overlap, but also some differences. So specifically focused on the right diagram, symptom dismissal and symptom awareness weren't found to be quite as significant issues. But amongst the, the um, men with hemophilia A and hemophilia B that I interviewed over the last few years, things that came up were the needs for emergency department care, coordinated surgical care, and and multidisciplinary and holistic care, although an area of overlap was the importance of having access to a hemophilia treatment center and the importance of having care plans. And again, you can see that recreation, education, career did come up again, but the type of burden that people experienced was quite different. So just very briefly, I'll highlight just a few quotes that maybe I'll um, leave up on the screen and potentially we'll be able to to return to this because again I, I really wanted patients to be able to tell their own stories and maybe focus in on this concept of people in remote settings having a really different experience than than those who do live in large urban centers i'm really fortunate to work and train in toronto and realize that that gives us quite a myopic view and so this was quite revelatory so just to highlight a few quotes for example one patient said that me and my dad had to make the five hour trip into the city to get my surgery and spend a few nights there just because I needed a factor nine infusion. And others talked about the burden of having to pay for gas or travel. One participant said that flights are $1,000 to get to their hemophilia treatment center, while another mentioned that they actually had to move closer to the city. Um, or someone having a physician saying, we don't deal with that there and or here, sorry. And you can imagine how, how invalidating that 
could be for some of these patients. And so I, I wanted to to really be able to present this in patients' own words and that this is my connection. And it's really been such a humbling and educational experience for me as someone who hopes to to work in leading disorders clinics throughout my career and help be able to to care for these women. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your passion and interest in this uh, area. Where I practice in uh, Thunder Bay, we have a geographic um, area as a regional program that is famously said to be uh, larger than the size of France, with um, approximately 270 um, people, 270,000 people scattered across that vast territory, some living in remote First Nations communities, others living in small communities, where, for example, if you lived in Kenora on the Lake of the Woods, if you need a platelet transfusion, the platelets are dispatched from Winnipeg and driven by taxi, um, which is a two and a half hour uh, drive for so and if you were to get in a car in thunder bay and drive to toronto without stopping you would have a 16 hour drive uh continuously so we live in a vast country and the this conversation that we're gathered to discuss today is is highly relevant so i have, I have one question for you which is um uh what future work is required to address the needs for women who are living in uh remote settings what would you suggest? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that the work needs to be geared at a couple of different levels, so both the healthcare provider level, but also at the patient level, so that we really are able to make more feasible and sustainable change. So with respect to some of the barriers that we found in our work from interviewing patients, I think for patients and caregivers, there really needs to be the development of easily accessible educational materials regarding normal versus abnormal bleeding that's readily available as early as puberty, because I think that's when you know, women are experiencing heavy vaginal bleeding and might not know or might have family histories that are normalizing heavy vaginal bleeding. And and there's actually quite a lot out there, but I think having increased awareness for patients around those resources to be able to, to begin that discussion is really important. And including self-advocacy toolkits or community-based initiatives where patients know how to be able to advocate for themselves. Because one of the themes that we saw was that, for example, women would say, you know, I know my life the best and I know what I'm experiencing the best, but sometimes that tension in the emergency room when I, I remember there was one woman who told me she could hear the doctors Googling her diagnosis or have nurses ask her to infuse her own factor and and you know, just feeling really unsupported in those acute settings when you're going in vulnerable and asking for help. And and I think at the healthcare provider level, I, I was only in medical school, I guess, eight years ago. And so there's quite a lot of work I think needs that needs to be done because I think it's still taught. Um, and I hope it's not though that hemophilia is a dis, is something that only men experience and it's not something that applies to women. And so I think we need to start revisiting and revising our curricula and and, you know, I don't think it stops with medical school. I think for for everyone, as we as we continue our education, there needs to be ongoing available medica uh, medical education events or CME events to prevent to, to have some incentivization for people to learn more. Um, clear referral guidelines to specialists and maybe some telehealth initiatives because we're focusing on on care in remote regions so that people can easily access. Um, specialists in this area so that instead of having that $1,000 trip to be able to see someone, they're able to get care sooner and then regular hospital audits, audits for products to make sure that's universally available. So I think there's a lot of different things that need to be done at the patient, healthcare provider, educational, and hopefully more national level to, to make sure we're providing equitable care. And, and it doesn't matter if you live in downtown Toronto or in Thunder Bay or anywhere in Canada, because everyone's deserving of the same quality of care. So some, some thoughts around that. Thank you. I'm I'm just very inspired, and um, and I'm so delighted that you're doing that work with a brilliant mentorship from uh, brilliant people. So, thank you, thank you. Um, we'll next move on to Dr. Uh, Rajni Kulkarni, and we'll have her uh, just give a brief um, overview of her work. Um, thank you, Dr. Kulkarni. 
Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm just so honored. And, uh, you know, this access to care for patients who are remote, uh, you know, has been a passion of mine. And I think the very first telemedicine clinic we did was in 1991. And I mean, that long ago, and that happened because of a snowstorm. So there was a snowstorm at Michigan State University. All the airports were closed. We used to fly up there. And, but the, up north, it was very clear weather. And the patients had come to the central hospital. And so instead of canceling the clinic, because the, you know, the healthcare provider couldn't be there, we ended up doing a telemedicine. So in Michigan, telemedicine has been in practice. Actually, one of the professors from Department of Communication from here had established a network. So we have done that. And since then, we do uh, what we call a virtual visit or a physical visit, an in-person visit, or a combination of the two. And we have involved the health department. So, uh, and I think, to me, the big and later on, we got a grant from the American Thrombosis Hemostasis Network to do uh, telecare for remote patient. And an important component of that was education of the physician and and patients' perspective of how they viewed us. And it was kind of very interesting because patients loved, and we published this as a letter to the editor in New England Journal that if a patient went to their local provider and had uh, a tally visit with a specialist, the cost was like $40. But if they came down, like what Dr. Arya showed, uh, took a Delta flight from way up north to down here, and we calculated the hours lost from work, the wages, the food, et cetera, et cetera, it was close to $1,800. So it was a huge saving. A very big advantage I found was that we could teach the primary care physician, you know, what is a bleeding disorder? So much so we taught her how to do DDAVP trials. So they didn't have to come down to have the DDAVP trials. She easily did it. And the the third thing was the 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 care expanded, and this was an advantage of that to not only people with bleeding disorder, but other hematologic disorders. So when I was doing a telemedicine visit, uh, Dr. Colleen Ballard Hicks, who's a primary care physician in Houghton Hancock, which is, so Michigan is like this, and I am here in the center of the mitten, and Houghton Hancock is the tip. You know, it's very easy to show where we are. And she said, Roshni, can you see this kid? He's got a lump in his neck, and lo and behold, he had a big lump. So this was not a bleeding patient, but we ended up, you know, uh, looking at that patient and 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 she had to be my hands and things like that. But then it turned out to be a benign lymph node. But I'm just telling you how it expands for the primary care physician who's so isolated and alone. You can do education. You can help them out with other things. And actually, there was a write up in the ABC News about this. Uh, in that time that how this has helped patients. And and I think uh, patients loved it. But right now, what I'm also trying to promote is not only rural telemedicine, but urban telemedicine. I look at a city like Toronto. It's a huge city or Tokyo or New York. If you have a bleeding disorder patient in one corner of the city, by the time that person gets to the center, it's a quite a number of hours. So how about if you start doing telemedicine hub and spoke model where you involve the local primary care physician and see the patient right there, you know? So clearly I think it has got a, a role and I'm sure, uh, you know, the, what the pandemic did was it create, uh, created a tsunami of uh, telemedicine. and. We looked at our uh, university telemedicine profile and it kind of went up and down with the pandemic. As the pandemic went down, the televisits went down. As the pandemic surged, so did the televisits. So patients didn't have to you know, come down. They're scared of coming down. 
that is a that is a, a, a really great uh, descri description of how this can be so functional and improve access to patients in remote communities. Where I practice currently, we have integrated into our computers. I've been in Thunder Bay since 2005, and we've been sort of super users for telehealth. So they're integrated into our computer. So in my schedule during a day, I can actually see a patient who's in, in a clinic room, come back to my desk, see a patient who's in a remote First Nations community who has the nurse practitioner with them. We, can, we have the capacity to add on an urgent or acute. And in addition, in our community, because of the, the vast geography, the terrible winter roads, um, we're able to see patients in a first consultation, get an assessment of the uh, whether it's a bleeding disorder or a hematologic malignancy, get an assessment with the patient. And then if they do have to come to Thunder Bay to travel, we can actually create a value-added visit where everything that they need is going to happen within a 24 to 48 hour time period. So they're not just scheduled as if they're someone living within our community. I think that um, I'm so delighted to hear of your wisdom and experience, and I hope that going forward, we could kind of put ourselves together across the country and kind of create a, a remote access model. What about if we thought about this as a twinning with our remote communities? And if we brought the same sort of um, expertise, multidisciplinary collaboration and created a twinning so that our remote bleeding disorders patients have the same access to care as those people living downtown. And so, that's what I suggested to World Federation, tele-twinning. Okay, I could not, I feel joy. I feel joy right now with the fairy godmother to hemophilia. I am just absolutely uh, joyous. Um, so I guess one last question for you would be, you know, what role would you see individual healthcare providers uh, to, would play a role in improving access? So someone living remotely or someone living in downtown Toronto? So I think we do a telecomprehensive care visit, you know, and what we have done is, so our team sees the patient and we can do, since we have like three, four or five rooms, we can see patient individually, like the social worker will see the patient in, in a separate room and the nurse can see a patient or whatever it is. And, and at the other side, at the patient side, you can actually do the same thing, you know, uh, have it have a conference with the physician separately versus with the nurses. So the two teams can integrate care. The other thing I also want to mention, we've been doing since last year, is research studies. So we have a study on women with von Willebrand's disease, uh, von Willebrand min study. So what I do is, I do a telemedicine visit with the patient, read out the consent form completely. And, and the patient then comes to the clinic. So this is a hybrid model where the patient comes to the clinic, then signs the consent form. They can actually sign it online. It doesn't matter, but it decreases the contact hours. And patients feel really good about it. So yes, the whole team, the research team can do it. The, psychosocial team and we are looking into dental hygienist and you know we already have a telegenetics which sees the patient and and they do their own thing and we are looking into uh, dental because that's a big problem uh, of getting those contraption where they can look in their mouth with more detail that that is you know, brilliant it's just it's just where your imagination can take you. And years ago, I worked with the Department of Engineering to develop a, a, a cyber glove where if you put your hand in here, you could actually palpate the patient with another glove. And that was to, to see whether we could do joint range of motion. Unfortunately, we didn't get the grant. And But, you know, the remote robotic surgeries are possible. All kinds of things are possible. So, you know, we have to wait and see. I'm all excited about the future. It will happen. I agree. We have um, one of our main concerns or challenges in our regional area is um, pre-diagnostic um, 
the the accuracy of the blood tests that we do send. They there's delay in transfer. We've had epidemics of diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease. In particular, our First Nations community are largely blood group O, and then the samples are collected, spend three days in transit, and then we have this this epidemic. And and what is secondary to that now is that um, there are entire communities where there's no dental access because the patient must be cleared from their von Willebrands. And we're seeing patients in consultation who are cachectic, young 19-year-olds, uh, emaciated from pain from dental caries and no access to care. And these are these, this is in Canada. And, um, and we really need to, to use this expertise to think about how we're going to help these patients. So thank you, thank you. I'm going to move on now to um, Wendy Quinn. And Wendy, you're uh, no stranger to all of these issues that we're talking about today. Can you talk to us briefly about your experience in this area? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. I think there's so much that has been mentioned already in terms of remote access. So my experience as we as I come to um, CHS as a volunteer, we may, we wear many hats and um, one of the hats that I wear is my professional hat, which is a nurse practitioner. And I have been in um, dedicated my my practice to um, delivering service to First Nations communities um, for about 21 years. Six of those years actually living on the in the community and raising my family there. So um, not only delivering service, but um, living amongst and being a part of the community. So um, what I have um, experienced in those times has been sort of eye-opening and I'm going to say this with with all due respect to every single person on this panel, but there's a there's a there is an um, a quote in a movie is, "Do you want the truth? Can you handle the truth?" And it sounds very negative when I say that, but there is a and I'm going to go into the question that you are, might want to be asking me because I know we're we're kind of crunched for time here, but the the question will be about iniquity, and so. As I live and deliver service in the in the communities, there's an iniquity that I don't think many people are aware of. And we talk about demographic remote access and not being able to travel. But there is a system in our in our country that has us in two different streams. So we have our our provincial health care that is universal to everyone or in every in every province and we also have our private insurance and our an insurance that that covers us for other things and then we have non-insured health benefits that covers first nations as well and so those are two buckets of of health care that we provide in canada um our non-insured patients in our in our in our remote communities have great service but when i'm sitting in a in a first nations community and i am looking at how they are going to get out they we're talking about telemedicine how when our when our infrastructures are not there to support a phone when our infrastructures are not there to uh support a proper wi-fi connection sometimes um that becomes a huge a huge issue so those are the types of things that that draw to iniquity but in the next piece i i'm going to bring us a personal story to this um and this this touches base with and it kind of amalgamates my 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 nurse practitioner role my mother role with a with a aligning it with a First Nations child as well who had a bleeding disorder. When my son was born, um, it just so happens coincidentally in a community that I worked in um, that there was a child born with hemophilia A. So he was born the same time as my son. So we were able to go down the road together in terms of his journey and my journey. So as a provider, of healthcare, but also a mother to a son with hemophilia A. 
I was very interested in this child and how he would manage. Knowing what I know and knowing what I can do for my son, how is this child going to manage in northern Saskatchewan with this, this issue? So as I was treating and learning how to do quarter cats and whatever, I, I, I had the nurses from Pelic, the, 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 the northern community that they knew about my son. So they would call me to get updates of how I was managing because they needed help to manage this child. So they would call me directly and I would give them and then I would ask them, how, how are you guys doing with them? How is the mother managing it? Unfortunately, the mother... And these are the realities. The mother was in jail. The mother had been arrested for um, an assault and she was in jail. So she was not a part of that, um, his care. And so he, he was left with, um, he was left with grandparents that were very um, uncertain and couldn't manage him. So my heart and my mind were always in line with this child as we as we went forward. And I always and I wasn't allowed as a as a um, part of hemophilia Saskatchewan. I wasn't allowed to reach out to him because I wasn't supposed to know about him. It was so it was so bizarre. But one day I was in the hospital and I saw his mother coming and I knew it was her because I knew she was from this community. And I saw her coming and I t and I said, I am me and I'm part of this. I'm, I'm part of Hemophilia Saskatchewan. Can we have your son come to our meetings? Can we can we bring him to us and can we make a connection with him and whatever? And she said, yes, that would be wonderful. I gave her my number. She never, ever did call. So the service, the access to him wasn't just about telemedicine. It wasn't just about anything. It was the it was the determinants of health. It was all of the things that we take for granted in our existence, in our worlds, that we have a shelter, we have support, we have a family. Most of us have all of those things made. But if you do not have that, you cannot take that next step. The sad story of this situation is the child was left to fend for himself. And I have people in the in the lab here where I live who always tracked what he was doing. And at one point he came from the northern community and and by himself on a and on medical taxi because he was bleeding and he had inhibitors and he got into a cab. He couldn't pay for it. He came to the hospital. He picked up his own product. He was 10 years old. This child at 12 years old passed away from his bleeding. And it was the most crushing situation in my career, in my life, as I see my 10 year old, 12 year old child thriving to where this child what, couldn't do it, couldn't do it. So when we are talking, we, there is an iniquity in this country, and there is a silence about that iniquity, that only if you walk in those paths and those treads that you will know about. And I'm not blaming anybody. We have a system, a system that sets us up for failure. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say that, but it does. And the only way that we are going to change that or be stewards is if we open our eyes, we forget the social noise and the social activisms that sometimes when we wear that orange shirt or we wear that red ribbon, is it about our egos or is it really about looking at what the problem is and doing something about it? So the only way I can do anything about it is when I'm serving the population that I serve in the northern communities, every single human being that sits in front of me, it, I'm their servant. And I feel when you look somebody in the eye and you say, I am you and you are me, and we are here together and we're both precious. Um, if every one of us can do that, all of that other noise will go away. So I guess 
I know I'm I'm sort of I'm speaking passionately because I'm I sit before um, who I see. So if we ever if we know about that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where our basic needs have to be met before we rise to the next level. I know another question, Nicole, that you had, and and I'm answering them again about empowerment. We cannot. I I don't have a good answer for that because how do we empower our patients? Um, again. How how do we empower somebody that doesn't have their basic needs met? Is where I'm going to come from. So that's that's my <laughs> story. Wendy, thank you so much for your passion and for conveying in such a powerful way what day to day life is. And I, and I agree that. Um, we, we don't need grandiosity here. We actually need to be looking at, um, you know, hands-on patients, listening to people and, and building a, a different way of caring for such patients. So thank you. I'm going to move on now to um, Pam Wilton. Um, Pam, as I said, well known to uh, everyone attending this uh, meeting. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm, I, it's really an honor to be part of this panel, and it's really hard to be the last speaker after all of your amazing talks. Um, I guess it's when your, your last name starts with a W, you get put at the end. Anyway, I just I want to reach out to um, uh, my fellow nurse that when you so describe what nursing is, that's if, if each of us as nurses do not treat our uh, patients the way you do, then shame on us. And certainly we have seen with our systems and not to drive into all of that, how much we need to do and how much we can't do. And it's frustrating. And I'm, I'm listening to, I'm a CBC junkie and I'm listening to the news. And actually I almost went to the Yukon two weeks ago to help them with their vaccines. Um, it, it didn't end up working out because now our, our, we need to, with the talk of Passport in Ontario, our numbers all of a sudden um, really rose and I was needed here. So here I am. But my work is, is taking me to northern parts, really, of my region. When I say northern parts, only two or three hours away, but I'm working with communities that are considered rural and somewhat remote, although there is a difference in that, and, and I hope we will speak to that at another time. I do feel very passionate about uh, talking about this, and again, using um, my knowledge as a nurse and everything that we know and you've alluded to here, not only is rural healthcare or remote healthcare difficult, but we know there are inequities for women in these areas. And nobody has talked about uh, some of We've talked about the geography and access and the cost and the expertise that is there, but the ability even within cities to get away from the job that you do. So if you work on a farm, uh, you know, it's difficult to maybe uh, be where you need to be in July and August in this province for us. But we also see that there are all those other social things around it. And we don't talk about abuse of women, but abuse, a woman with a bleeding order who's being abused by her partner and who's a partner is preventing her from accessing the care. And in order to get from that remote area to where she needs to be, there might be a cost that would maybe have to go through her, her uh, partner or whatever that might be. So there's a whole lot of issues related to the bleeding disorders. And, um, you know, once a nurse, always a nurse. And even though I'm supposed to be retired, I don't think that I will stop caring and for my work to kind of transition. It's always been with the bleeding disorders community, but I see such a need that we have to help fulfill those needs. So maybe, Nicole, I'll let you ask that question that you have for me if you want to ask that, and I'll jump in there so people understand what it is that I'm trying to answer for you today. Yeah, specifically, we were talking about, um, do you think that the term hemophilia carrier underestimates the bleeding uh, for um, patients, for, for women everywhere? And then again, how is that accentuated in more remote yeah. communities? 
And everybody on this call, if you've been here before or on the conference, knows what I'm going to say. Of course it does. And I've seen that with my own story. I tell people I'm a carrier and it means nothing to them. Um, even if I've fallen and I've gone into a merge in a city that is a teaching center with um, um, a medical school, nursing school, a physio school, we've got everything we hear. And, and so what does that mean? It's meaningless to them. Um, and so I can't even imagine if you are living more remotely what that what that means to anybody. So, of course, it's inadequate. All of you have already so nicely highlighted what some of those problems are with our our uh, remote communities. But um, specifically, one of the things that we maybe haven't talked about, although I love the idea of twinning, is the access to the care and the distance to care. Now you talked about that, but let's see I even get someone to believe me that I do have a bleeding problem. Um, the chances of me getting an appropriate referral can be very, very slim. And so that then becomes a challenge that, okay, somebody listened, but now what are they gonna do with me? Because you may not even have a hematologist in the area or near the area, or maybe you have someone who does sort of a rotating clinic and gets there. But does that hematologist even have much expertise in terms of women with bleeding disorders? And so that's certainly a problem. Uh, when you're living remotely, uh, it could be because you've moved from family for a job or followed the person that you loved. And maybe you're away from family where as you go through, uh, my dear my dear friend yesterday uh, spoke um, so nicely about the seasons of life. And as you go through those seasons, you know, maybe as a little girl or a teenager or a um, just starting your career, your mom was there, your sisters were there and you spoke to them regularly. But now that you're living remotely, maybe it's more difficult to make the connections with those women who maybe have the same problems that you do and you can have that discussion with them. And just again, I'm gonna say it again, remember you're adding a rare bleeding disorder on top of all those problems in a remote setting that you already have. We talked a little bit about it with Wendy, but I know as a nurse that when I was trying to educate um, about asthma and COPD, for instance, low German has no written language. We have a lot of low German in uh, Southwestern Ontario. How do I educate those people when I don't have the materials that I need that they can even read? And so if you think of uh, remote areas, we have Anabaptists and their beliefs here in Southwestern Ontario, even with our vaccining, that that becomes an issue. Um, so the teaching tools that are appropriate to that population are gonna be different in the city, in different, um, in different remote areas, according to the culture and their belief system and their access. You might have everything you need beautifully online, but if you don't have access to a computer or even a library that you can go into access a computer, if you're trying to get information and your partner isn't supporting you, you're trying to do it secretly, maybe, to protect yourself um, from something even worse. So you have all those things on top of it. And then uh, finally, the access to the appropriate expertise. And we've, uh, I think we've, we've covered that, we've addressed it. But the nice thing when you're working as all of you or most of you on this call, you're working in large centers. Most of our clinics are in teaching centers. And if you are, having some difficulty, you might be, can speak to your colleague who has an office down the hall. And, and uh, Roshina, you said you're, you're um, you know, you got a message from your colleague, I got this kid, who? And then you went on to say it. But we all know in healthcare, we do those hallway consults privately. We're protecting your privacy, of course. But it's easy to reach out, what do you think I should do? And so you could put your heads together. You can't do that remotely. Um, and we just talk about if nobody is listening to you, um, I'm fairly articulate. My English is fairly adequate. Um, I'm a healthcare provider. I know the system. I'm old. People did not listen to me. And I cried because I thought if people aren't listening to me, what about people who have no education, who don't know who to reach out to, who have no confidence? If you didn't hear me and I couldn't get you to understand that I was bleeding and I was in trouble, um, when I have 
a, a car accident or when I have my appendix out or um, when I have a period that goes on for a million and one days uh, and I'm in trouble, how do you send me to get the appropriate care? You know, when I've had my appendix out and I'm bleeding out, like, who are you going to call? What are you going to do for me? It's too late. And in those remote areas, as opposed to a big center, where maybe somebody would have a light go and say, hey, does anyone know if this woman has a bleeding disorder? What's going to be the outcome for that woman? And um, yeah, I could go on and on here. I'm, I'm aware of our time. And I know you do have one more question for me, Nicole, if you've got the time. And I really would like to give a short answer uh, to that question that I think is important. Pam, so in, 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 my, um, in my program, we, we begin all of our meetings with a patient story. And we remind everyone that the reason we have meetings is to remind us about our work. So I want to thank you so much. I know you're a nurse, but in addition to your professional experience, you brought the voice of the patient to, to this panel. Um, and I, I think uh, I just want to thank all of you for your outstanding contribution to patient care and for being the voice of patients and healthcare providers for the future for how we can do things um, better. I don't see any questions. I'm sure that if there are any further questions, if anyone has any questions of me, please feel free to contact me. I look forward to my, my colleagues looking for ways to us to, um, to look at telehealth twinning. I think that is exactly the vision that I see um, in, in, in my remote community. And a, there are not a lot of hematologists practicing here. And we do, we are, I am a Jill of all trades, treating acute leukemia and bleeding disorders. And I think that pro, that's not a sustainable model for the future with more uh, refined um, uh, therapies. And so we really need to find a way to have our patients get access to that care that they need. And I'm so proud of all of you for the work that you're doing. And it's really been a great honor uh, to meet with you today. And thanks to the organizers for having the vision. I sort of see this as a beginning um, and there's lots and lots of work for, um, for us to do. So uh, thank you very much. Let me know if I can help in any way. It's been a great pleasure. I want to thank you so much for your contributions today.